Welcome to my neighborhood, where I'll interview several industry luminaries and interesting people who are changing the state of the art in accounting software technology. Some of my guests are CEOs of leading corporations that you may have already heard of, maybe you're already using their products, or I think will soon be using their products, as well as some interesting thought leaders who help us learn more about technology and how to put it to use. Today I have with me Rod Drury, founder and CEO of Zero, an online accounting solution serving over 250,000 small businesses in over 100 countries. Ernst & Young has recently recognized Rod's achievements with the 2013 Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. In 2006 and 2007, he was awarded the New Zealand High Tech Entrepreneur of the Year Award. And in 2009, he was inducted into the New Zealand High Tech Hall of Fame. So please welcome Rod Drury. So thank you for being here with me, Rod, in the neighborhood. <laughs> hey, uh, I mean, we've you. been uh, we've known each other for three or four years now, so it's always good to catch up with you and Cheryl. It's good, good, great to see you guys. It is, and I'm, I'm so honored that you've uh, come to our show because I've got all these questions for you that I think I'm curious about and our audience is curious about. Because on the surface, we see what you're doing uh, and what you've done in terms of, uh, let's say, the accounting in small business for the United States is just, it's just so disruptive. And I congratulate you on what you've been able to achieve in really a short period of time. You probably think it's been forever, but, but uh, congrats for that. And how, what do you attribute this uh, very fast growth and, and uh, awareness in the U.S. to? Yeah, so I think the big picture is you see these big technology shifts happen all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So we've seen, you know, what happened with mainframe computers going down to mini computers and client-server computing, the big rise in enterprise computing. And, uh, you know, cloud is just one of those fundamental changes that you always hope that your career's in a position where these things happen. So the impact of cloud fundamentally changes the economics of getting technology out to, you know, millions of people. And uh, you know the small business segment is a massive segment. hasn't seen a lot of innovation for a while, and it's just something that's you know just incredibly exciting. Right. Well, so like, what led you to this? You'd been doing all these different technology startups. You started a company that became a, a very large Microsoft partner in software development and and consulting. And so obviously, you were successful on your uh, in what you were doing. It was probably the old world though, right? Mm. Server stuff. So what, what is it that made you finally say, I'm gonna do something completely new? Uh, was it just the cloud or was there more to it than that? You know, so I think um, what we're doing with Zero was a culmination of a whole lot of work. So I started my career out uh, with Arthur Young, went through the merger um, uh, to Ernst & Young. So that was why it was really cool to win the Entrepreneur of the Year because it was my old firm putting all, all of that together. So that was cool. Um, and when I, was at, uh, when I was inside Ernst & Young, um, I was doing implementation of large financial management systems and I'd also come from a very strong programming and database background so I'd always as I'm implementing financial thinking about man wouldn't it be great if this was over a beautiful relational database if you get information in how, how easy it would be to get information out and as I'd looked at sort of large enterprise accounting software and some of the sort of desktop software that came out through the Windows generation it just felt it could be so much better and uh, so I think people who are in the accounting software industry do have a passion for um, accounting. For mm -hmm. some reason, we love debits and credits and the <laughs> symmetry of it. And I think the other you know, big thing is, if you look at, um, at GDP in all countries, small business is the biggest sector. So if you want to do something purposeful with your life, helping small businesses be more productive, these are real people, is a purposeful thing to do. And you know, we just get um, so excited when we see ordinary people who, who, who love technology and, and, and enjoy the work that we do. Yeah, yeah, and it really is all about that small business who doesn't have access to the, uh, to the huge uh, mainframe systems of the past that only large companies had access to, are really bringing that kind of power down to the to the small business, which is totally disruptive to uh, really all of us. Uh, disruptive in the one hand and the other is just incredible power. Some of the things I find when, when given power, the small businesses are actually like, what do I do with it? They're yeah. almost, uh, so how would you advise a small business owner right today? Maybe they're already started uh, or maybe they've come, uh, just about to start. 
what technology stack should they use? We use the word technology stack in the techiness, but uh, what, what kind of technology should they use to run their enterprise? Why zero? Why not something else? Or what about zero and maybe something else? What, how would you characterize the best thing for that small business owner? Yeah, so I think for small business to understand is, is now that the cost of getting technology to small business has changed because you only have to write something once, put it on some servers somewhere, mm -hmm. and then anyone can just come on. So there's a, the, that's the fundamental change of the cloud. The mm -hmm. distribution cost has changed. So what you're seeing now is massive investment right. you know, from all of the incumbent providers, from new entrants like us, and a whole bunch of small companies. So right. the, the small business space has never been attractive to sell into before, and now you're seeing very bright people and a heap of funding, hundreds of millions of dollars, coming into small business systems. Mm -hmm. In the the, the the small business internet's quite an interesting hybrid because it has all of the discipline and big investment of enterprise software and the people from enterprise software, but it has to have the sales, the marketing, the social media of consumer software. So it's a pretty interesting hybrid. And so you're seeing these quite complex businesses that are you know, marketing and selling online, but also writing kind of complex business apps. So these aren't, you know, spend, uh, you know, two weekends in a garage building a bit of software, it's $200 million plus investment. Yeah. So understanding there's this investment that can really help you. So seven or eight years into the journey, you know, we have to take the time to write the, um, you know, the complex functionality, but we're seeing the benefits of it now. So like, it's a really good example. Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe 14 months ago, we reduced our online invoicing features. Mm -hmm. So, so what? What that means is rather than a small business sending an invoice uh, out as a PDF or printing it out and mailing it, and a few weeks later you phone up and you say, have you seen my invoice? They have to click on a link to download their invoice, you know, within a few minutes. So we're at, we've now been able to measure this data for a year, and we've seen that um, uh, after online invoicing, our average customer time to collect has dropped from six weeks to under four. So then you, so anyone sees that and you go, well, I have to be on online accounting. There you go. Because because it, it, there's a yeah. direct benefit. It's all about cash flow. Yeah, um, and I've watched that trend, and it's just uh, incredible for us to see the consultants in this leader group network are starting to see these benefits and and implement them on clients and so so I'm really with you there so let me go back a little bit to uh, sort of was there a point um, I don't care how far back you want to go but was there a point in your early life where you just said aha this is what I want to do and if there was like what what was the aha there's some point in your life uh, this is my life mission yeah I think it was actually back <clears throat> um, at university and maybe even at primary school at, um, at secondary school before that at, uh, you know the magic of computers. You know, normally traditional you know workers they 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 use their hands to make things, mm -hmm. and I just love that a computer uh, you could um, kind of tell it to do stuff, and you're kind of building these machines. Yeah. And that the scale of that just you know is is yeah. hugely exciting. And I remember back in the um, uh, the 80s there was a um, kind of a new set of of sort of business uh, processes called information engineering which allowed you to model businesses on diagrams so you could have a conversation about how businesses worked and that really kind of resonated with me as well and I remember when Microsoft Access first came out suddenly you could take the results of modeling what businesses look like and build them very quickly and have you know 20 people operating on the same system and uh, you know that was just incredibly powerful and then I think as the, each of the technology generations come, you just see these mass, massive opportunities. And I remember the aha moment, one of the big ones for me, was when you could uh, write a piece of software that lived on a web server, and without anyone installing something, they just log in and they can do work. Yeah. And it was like, man, that's infinite scale. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, our careers um, are mirrors in many ways. I was in an accounting firm and I was automating payroll taxes for the firm, whereas before we were making money doing payroll taxes with typewriters and we were automating. So I, I got some, some of those same sort of ahas that you're talking yeah. about. It just, it just completely changes the whole way of thinking about doing, uh, doing accounting, doing business operations, and that just really turns me on. So I'm, I'm glad somebody like you came along to actually, well, the way I look at it is opt in fully 
and create the rest of the things that need to happen in order to bring about the, the, the folks. Uh, and and but there's people like me in each generation, right? So yeah. Scott Cook at Intuit, sure. passionate about small business, yeah. change the world. Craig Winkler from yeah. MYOB. And you yeah. know, one of the, the some of the highlights of my career is meeting those sort of people who did it in their generation of technology. Right. And I think we're all very similar in that we all love small business and yeah. passionate about them. Because yeah. the, the thing that's different with small business from enterprise software is it's real people. Yeah. And um, you know, the in a CPA community, you know, we meet them and you you know, you you, right. you know, you, you get to know them. These are real people. Yeah. And I think we all share that passion for making their lives better. Mm-hmm. So, Rod, somewhere in your past, I'm sure you had some difficulties. Maybe you were starting a company. It wasn't going well. Maybe you were advising a client uh, in, in your services business. Uh, things weren't going well at some point, I'm sure. Tell me how you get across uh, the humps of life where it's just not working. Do, do you, how do you get over those humps? What do, you, what do you do? Yeah, so probably the biggest thing that I've had to deal with through my working career is um, a stutter. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, right through my early twenties, I could hardly get a word out. So um, you know, when you got when you you know, obviously full of ideas and all that sort of stuff, that was an incredibly frustrating time. And um, uh, you know, I remember being in meetings, and you have that creeping introduction of death mm-hmm. when you say a name, and you can't even get you, you yeah. get hang your name out. Yeah. So uh, you know, that was one of those uh, you know really hard things at a personal level. Uh, that I've had to deal with, and even now, you know, I do a bit of TV, doing some camera work sure. now, I do some radio, and uh, you know, the fear of doing that is something that's sort of still yeah. praised. You know, people yeah. say you're scared of public. You're such speaking. a confident person. It's yeah. uh, well, because I, you know, because I'm doing it so much, yeah. and I think that's what happened. I just uh-huh. sort of crashed through it. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, that's been one of the uh, as I've been doing all the stuff. That's mm-hmm. always something that's always been there all the way mm-hmm. through. And I think um, you know, I've done two or three different businesses now. One of the big things that I learned was, you know, the, these are definitely team efforts, and uh, having diversity of talent, uh, making sure that you're working with people you enjoy working with, and that you have complementary skills. You don't want everyone the same. Right. So I'm definitely the, you know, get things started, have the great vision, um, and with this business, really made sure we put great operating people inside the business. And I think. Um, you know, business is all about people. It's a huge amount of fun. You spend a lot of time with those people, getting a great team, and making sure you're, um, you know, filling that senior team out. You know, and all the way through the business with complementary skills mm-hmm. um, has been good. So that the businesses I haven't enjoyed is when we haven't um, kind of had that um, really humming team at the top. And so with everything I've sort of done, um, you know, recently, it's all about making sure you're working with great people. The right people, in the right places. So. Um you said once, I, I love to quote you every now and then because I've watched some of the th- things you've talked about in, in speeches and so forth. You said once, A's hire A's and B's hire C's. Can you tell me what you're talking about? Yeah, so what we found is if you want to grow quickly, um, you can't compromise on culture and the quality of people. And so <clears> you know, one of the guys on our board, Sam Morgan, quoted this to me, A's hire A's and B's hire C's. <laughs> and what that's saying is you want to make sure that the people who are hiring are hiring the best people. If you have people that aren't, aren't you know, right at that top level, they won't hire the top level themselves. Mm-hmm. And quickly you see the quality go through. And one of the most amazing things, we're up in San Fran where we are now in uh, ZeroCon last year, and I met 50 new Zeros where I wasn't even their great grand hirer. There mm-hmm. was, you know, um, the you know three or four yeah. people down the chain had hired them, and they were completely on brand, completely on culture. We felt like friends straight away, mm-hmm. and that was such a neat moment because we had, you know, kept that quality level all yeah. the way through. And you call them zeros. Yeah. <laughs> so the, an employee at zero is a is a zero. <laughs> yeah, I think this comes. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think this comes down to, you know, what, what are you trying to do? These, are these next generation companies. So. Right. You know, you d- to build a big company now, you don't need a lot of infrastructure, mm-hmm. and you know the tools make it so easy to do. So we're seeing these next generation companies right. where you're taking, you know, people from great organisations. You know, we've got, um, you know, quite a lot of our of our leaders are from Microsoft, from Google. These are high quality companies right. coming into these very lean businesses where there's almost no grown ups. You know, you've grown up with the internet. Like we don't have any PAs or EAs. Right. I don't even have a desk. Yeah. Um, you just do your work, you work from home, you try to pick up your kids in the morning if you're at home, you travel a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, these are next generation, very nimble, kind of global from day one companies. Yeah, yeah, that's great. How did you come up with the name Zero? 
Well, we struggled with the name uh, when we started, and you know, our kind of working title was it was Accounting 2.0, and which was a terrible name, but that was kind of what we were. We thought mm-hmm. we were the next generation, yeah. and this was the business. That would have been the easy name, Accounting yeah. 2.0. Yeah. <laughs> but everyone said, "Well, what happens when three comes out?" So, <laughs> yeah. so that that kind of didn't work. And we really wanted. We were thinking about who are the big companies, and in our space, SAP, Three Letter Dot Com. Mm-hmm. We knew we wouldn't get out. We really wanted a Four Letter Dot Com. Someone thought of zero with a Z. And uh, we started discussing it actually, and uh, with the person who owned the domain, it was a hundred grand to get started. Mm. And we ended up finding someone said, "Well, let's try it with an X." And it turned out it was a guy in uh, New York who wasn't um, using the the zero dot com domain name. He was kind of using it for FTP. Mm-hmm. So we uh, phoned him up and um, said, "Would you like to sell it?" He said, "Well, I've you know turned down ten grand before." And uh, so we tried to take take the, the money out of the equation and said, well, what about if we give you a couple of business class tickets to New Zealand or something? And he said, actually, that sounds interesting. Turned out he was just having a baby and his wife said, take the money. <laughs> so finally, after about three or four months, we had a name that we could um, uh, do something with, you know, and it seems to have worked. Breaks the cardinal rule, though. You always want to have a business that starts with A. With an A, yeah. yeah. Um, but so are you saying... Well, okay, most people know this, if they know anything about your product, that it implements what I've been terming the the zero entry trend, meaning less data entry for the bookkeeper and automated data flows into the general ledger. And so to me, that's where it resonates. When it says zero, it actually means what it is. And so was that in your thinking or is that just No, it was about? just a cool name. And, you know, by zero, wow. it sounded kind of mathematical and, and that sort of stuff. But that... Um, that zero data entry is super interesting. We didn't have that as a goal when we started, but what we did have was taking a, a design-led approach. So we didn't say, let's take desktop accounting software and move it online, because desktop accounting software was developed before email was around, before yeah. the internet was here. So we said, actually, let's follow small business owners around and see what they actually do. So one of the you know, early cool things was, you know, we worked out that small businesses go to their online bank account first thing in the morning. Yeah. And they see who pays pays them, but they don't process the data. So the horror of small business is having to come back in the weekend and do the books. I was talking yeah. to a lady yesterday who spends six hours on a Saturday doing the books. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah. So what we thought was, well, what if we could get the bank data directly or automatically into your accounting software and we kick off with a bank rec as your data entry activities and then you're up to date, you don't have the catch up. So right through zero, we've tried to um, stand back and just rethink about business processes now that we're all connected. And I think that's one of the really fun things. We're really making significant process change um, to to how we do things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, so if, if uh, some budding entrepreneur out there is listening, um, what kind of advice might you give to someone who wanted to start a company uh, maybe maybe at any scale, but I mean, obviously you went into a pretty large scale effort, but maybe they just want to go and start an accounting practice. Maybe they want to go start a small software company or a large one. What kind of things would you suggest they start with? Yeah, so so, so I think, um, you know, what I found, I was involved with um, Trade Me, New Zealand's version of eBay, and uh, we sold that business for um, a half a billion US dollars um, eight or nine years ago. And we saw a lot of young guys earn a lot of money really early. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, on the board of it, so I was the closest guy to the deal that got no cash, which was cool. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I saw a bunch of young guys make make some money, and and they did really, really well. And what they did was they smacked their financial goals out of the park really early on life, late 20s, early 30s. And in the US, there's lots of examples of people that have made money really early. And, uh, and, and, And at that point, I was just starting to have children what I realized was actually uh, working is a, is a big part of the fun that you have in your life if you're doing something purposeful. And so that kind of led me to think it's not a race to you know get that big check. Yeah. Actually, if you can build a sustainable life that you enjoy doing and hit those goals, working is a, is a really kind of cool thing to do. You get to hang out with neat people, you get to travel, and you've, you have a real sense of purpose. So if that's the case, then you think about entrepreneurship as a series of baby steps. With each um, business you do, you're getting, um, you know, you're building your networks, you're getting more of your own capital, so you can own more of it the next time, you're getting more experience, you're finding more purposeful ideas that you can do. Mm-hmm. So my advice is to 
First of all, if you're inside an organization, think about internal entrepreneurship. So how can you improve the business that you're in? You know, pitch to your boss, hey, here's a great idea, let me follow it through. Mm -hmm. So you get that positive feedback of doing something good. When you are ready to go out, um, you know, I think, and especially when you start thinking about taking money, you really want to give your investors a great result right. so that the next time you get them back in again and you go bigger and bigger. Um, so I think the, the key thing is thinking about it as a series of baby steps mm -hmm. and think about entrepreneurship inside your own business first of all. Yeah, yeah. So two things that I heard you say. One, um, you said internal entrepreneurship. I, I, I call that passion. And basically, if you can, I think that's what you're saying is I was so passionate about what I was doing. It was, it was how I wanted to live in my life. Mm. Is that what you're essentially saying there? Yeah, but I'm saying like as a, as a start, isn't it great? I mean, you have staff and staff come up and say, look, I've got this great idea. I really yeah, want to run with right. it. Like, fantastic. Yeah. You know, here's what I suggest. Look at this, do this, make it happen internally. Yeah. And then they get that positive experience. They're going to do more and more yeah. and more. So you don't have to leave a business and, you know, wind up your mortgage to, 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 to be an entrepreneur. You can do that inside where you work, work right now. And most good good employers will love that you've taken the initiative yeah. and taken ownership of something. Yeah. So I think it starts there, and then there's that scary stage of actually going out on your own. Uh, something else you said was um, about taking money, and I I think you mean from like a venture capitalist or maybe an, an angel vent investor. Uh, do do I want to do that first, or do I want to wait as long as ever as I can to take money, or do I really never want to take money? How would you weigh those out if I'm starting a business? So the best way to raise money is to not need it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so if you're desperately trying to get stuff, it's really hard to get funded. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, I think um, you know it's a whole spectrum, and it's not one answer for all. One of the interesting things we've seen, so you know, we think building a big horizontal platform is a couple of hundred million dollar investment because right. you you know you buy, you you're having to you know build a massive amount of software build all your business operating systems you know your, your sure. sales ticketing all that sort of stuff and then you've got really bad cash flow because you don't have a lot of customers in the beginning and get a small amount of money so 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 that's just a big checkbook you have to raise the money to play there mm -hmm. but we're seeing you know you've got 300 now little companies in our ecosystem We've already got the customer base, we have the accountants channel. So what I kind of love about what we're doing is we're seeing these great little companies who can build niche products um, and really just focus on the tech and you know building a great website and then leveraging the market that we've already opened up. So we're seeing quite a nice balance um, kind of spectrum of very small companies that are self-funded and then we've even seen a few who are in our ecosystem that have been publicly funded um, uh, since we've been around. So these new platform players, like same with Salesforce and Force.com, a lot of uh, new innovation and in smaller companies. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, um, I guess, you know, like I imagine the Ford Motor Company has a bunch of other little satellite companies that build uh, windscreen wipers and door handles sure. all around the factory. Right. And we're seeing that in software as well. So there are places to start. Yeah, and in your ecosystem of developer add-ons, it's it's grown very quickly. I've been really impressed with that. I think you have 300 and some companies out there yeah. circling around the zero uh, ecosystem. That's, that's really impressive because I you know, live in the software development world uh, all the way back to my days at Apple, where getting developers to develop around your ecosystem is the most important thing. I was there when the Macintosh was not really doing so well. Yeah. It was because there was no software. And, uh, so I, I appreciate how hard that is for a for a platform as you are uh, to get people to follow you, yeah. uh, and then and then keep them and then have their businesses succeed. That's the the part that that is actually really impressive. Yeah. So, um, and the, the you know people say, are you a platform? That's really interesting because in a pure technology um, uh, place, people say, well, a platform is people are running on top of your stack. And mm -hmm. we think in small business software, not at all. It's actually about um, having loosely coupled applications, so there's lots of choice. Mm -hmm. So we, what we're trying to do actually is commoditize accounting software. It's, it's compliance. Right. Um, it adds value, but really it's, it's just doing compliance. It's, right. not, it's not really making the boat go faster, other than it's, it's saving you a whole lot of time. Yeah. What we think small businesses should be spending their money on is actually those add-on applications, which are much more in their industry, which makes them drive new sales, right. Um, you know, radically improves their service to customers. Right. And I think that's what's super exciting. And what we have to be careful about is we don't trash the price because, you know, we're a low cost commodity product, you know, $39, $49, $50 a month sort of, sort of, sort right. of money. Um, you have to have 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of customers to support that price point. What we hope to see is these uh, niche vertical application providers that might have a viable business with 500 customers. So you might be the best uh, wine management software or yeah, yeah. Uh, winery super management. Super vertical. Super, super vertical. Right. Uh, because you re you really make that industry a whole lot better, right. and so um, you know we far prefer that people spend their money on the add-ons on those right. line of business on the ads. chunks exactly mm -hmm. you know but things that make their business actually better yeah so I'm referring to most of the people that are listening may know that I'm real passionate about chunkification of the business process and this is exactly what you just articulated it's uh, the general ledger is is a piece of it and it's you said loosely coupled. I've always thought it a little more tightly coupled, but this digital plumbing that goes between yeah. different chunks of the business process, and it does allow a, a wine, you know, maker's dream software product management, uh, wine maker management product, to thrive with maybe a total available market of a couple thousand customers, where they could never win, they could never do that if they didn't have some of the. I would say that the core stuff that you bring to them, which is general ledger, AR, AP, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that's a trend we're really seeing, and I, and I I think uh, you've you've articulated in a way that I've actually didn't expect you to say. I thought I would have thought you would have said our platform and everybody on it, but I think it's maybe you're right. It's it's more um, parallel or or, or uh, you know touching to touching as opposed to. Uh, somehow hierarchical. Yeah, it's basically server to server. Yeah. You know, all, all compute. You know, internet computers can talk to other internet computers. Right. We don't even care what, what their software is built in. Yeah. We we um you know we agree what the interfaces yeah. are. So the difference is, if you think back to desktop or on-premise software, it was a ten grand exercise to link software together on premises. Yeah. So you just didn't do it with a consultant. With a consultant, it's always a bad experience. Back, and, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, all of that. And what's happening now, these are pre-integrated apps yes. where the two vendors have got it linking together. Right. And I think what we're going to see now is the, the next generation value-added reseller, mm -hmm. the old VAR in the Microsoft right. land, will be someone who connects cloud business applications together. Yeah. And that, I think that's a massive opportunity. And what we're seeing in some of our other countries is accounting firms now adding this uh, value-added reseller. Uh, business into their practice because it's not about compliance anymore it's actually making the boat go right. faster for right. businesses well two things about that um, um, one I want to ask you is this chunkification uh, a pendulum that may shift back so what I mean is if you've got general ledger software with a feature set that is and then you get all these chunks out there doing cool things and you as a company are growing do you see a need for you to then essentially buy them or whatever implement those things and 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 grow your product so that there's I would just then start to see it as a pendulum of chunkification unification chunk of is that happening or what do you see about that potentially but I think it's such a long cycle like we've been going for eight years and right. we've still got a lot of stuff to do as you know so right. we've got 10 years worth of product to build right um, and all new, you know as, as well as the things we kind of have to do to be a, you know complete accounting software so many opportunities just around our core about mm -hmm. linking to other data sets and doing more having the servers do more of the work while our business owners are sleeping right um, so I just actually think no one will have the time to do it all there's so much opportunity in the cloud and so many applications to be built mm -hmm. that um, we're still in the very early stages that we've still got 10 years worth of just going crazy writing cool product. Eventually it'll probably be more around um, capital markets and structuring, you'll see some roll ups mm -hmm. but because that, that's what tends to happen in these technology cycles but I think that's 10 years away because there's so much to do. Yeah. One of the things you know I'm passionate about or at least I talk a lot about is trust because I believe that our, our people in the accounting world, are that we live by trust. Our clients have to trust that we are um, there for their interest and stuff. How do you build trust? How would you uh, recommend the, the, the people listening to you, whether they're building software or doing client services, uh, how have you built trust among your clients or employees or, or customers? So I think the internet has flipped trust around. So you think about the old world when you know you'd have a 
um, you know, a centrally managed organization that would build software sometime, you know, every 18 months they'd ship a new version, it gets sent around to shelves. Right. There's a very long, long, <coughs> long um, mm -hmm. link till the end user actually starts using it. By the time they get annoyed with something, they'll log it in a forum, it might be two years, maybe five years till they see that thing improved. On the internet, it's all inverted. You know, I'm public, we're on a blog, our customers can complain, everyone can see those complaints, they can also praise us. So I think this rapid feedback cycle and the fact that the smallest customer now has an immediate voice. An equal voice. An equal yeah, voice yeah. and can, you know, and can broadcast. I mean, we have people on our, um, on our uh, blog, you know, thinking that we're evil, you know, yeah, and typing yeah, yeah. away. That's the internet. So mm -hmm. we have to, you know, calmly talk them and, yeah. you know, we've made mistakes and we've fixed them up because we get the sure. uh, immediate feedback. So I think the trust loop is so much more intimate yeah. on the internet. And, you know, we've been doing this for eight years now. We haven't really screwed up. Mm -hmm. We've, um, you know, we've taken people on a journey. We've keep keeping to, to deliver. Mm -hmm. So I think we're earning trust. But it is interesting. I think there's still this bias that, hey, you guys are going to get really big and then somehow you're going to screw us. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I think, you know, you can put yourself out there and we're real people with families and, you know, we generally want to help them. So no, I think it's working. Online accounting is a very temporary product category. You won't even talk about it in five years. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Well, because at this part of the industry, we the tickets to the game is you need to, we need to build all of the accounting features you're used to in desktop software. Mm -hmm. But what we're really doing is we're, you know, because that's the core application, but we're actually connecting businesses to each other, large businesses to small businesses. I was out with Workday yesterday. You know, zero, Workday, what's that got to do with each other? Well, for a company like Workday, they're going in and they're automating, you know, large scale businesses. They deal with thousands of suppliers. Small business cloud accounting is giving them electronic data interchange endpoints to talk to. So this is actually about we are now re-architecting how businesses communicate with each other. And the accounting will just fade to the back and it will be all be about how you drive your business processes. So as I said, I think online accounting is a very temporary category. This is just how businesses run in the future. So really being, you know, process consultants. Um, you know, marketing consultants, being able to do simple integration and data flows, those are the, the next generation skills. And, you know, that's the challenge for all of us in the industry and the opportunity um, to, to really rethink about how we work. Interesting. Well, I sure appreciate that you've been spent this time with me today and I wish you really well in, in your, your future and your, your company. It's just going like crazy. So look forward to seeing you in November at our conference and maybe several times between now and then. Fantastic. Thank you. Good to see you, Doug. Thank you. So thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you next time.